One of the biggest names in Silicon Valley is reportedly placing a big bet on a popular digital currency. According to the Wall Street Journal, venture capitalist and PayPal co-founder Peter Thiel has invested millions of dollars in Bitcoin. His involvement is likely to bolster the currency's drive for legitimacy after a tumultuous ride last month. The cryptocurrency soared to nearly $20,000 in December before taking a significant plummet. That volatility has some investors worried about a potential Bitcoin bubble. Peter Van Valkenburg is director of research at nonprofit group Coin Center, and he joins us now from Washington. So, Peter, what does Teal's investment really indicate to you? So, I mean, it's important to put it into perspective, I think. The, the Founders Fund, I think, is, a, is, is roughly a $3 billion uh, fund as far as assets under management. And um, we're talking, a, a, you know, millions invested, but millions invested back before Bitcoin had its massive run-up in price this past year. So now maybe hundreds of millions held in Bitcoin by the Founders Fund, but still small on the order of the entire fund. And you look at other investments that Peter Thiel has made, early investor in SpaceX with that fund, early investor in Airbnb. And I think that speaks to the gamble. You know, those are risky ventures, but they're also potentially very profitable ventures uh, if they work out. And I think Bitcoin's very similar. So Peter, the biggest concern it seems right now surrounding Bitcoin is this idea of a bubble. What's your take on that and the notion that a cryptocurrency is, for some people, a very speculative asset? Yeah, it is definitely a speculative asset. And I wouldn't advise your average investor to make a big investment in this technology or in the cryptocurrency or in any cryptocurrency. These are risky new technologies. And I think the best analogy for what we're seeing right now in the cryptocurrency space is the dot-com bubble of the 1990s. Now, what's important to point out there is that it's not all funny money. It's not all just silliness. There are companies in the 1990s that were funded that shouldn't have gotten funded, like Pets.com, which blew all their money on a bad Super Bowl ad. But there were also companies in the 1990s like Amazon, which it would be ridiculous to say that they were overvalued at the time because Jeff Bezos has become the richest man in the world. The question with cryptocurrency is there are projects getting funded that are probably garbage. There are projects getting funded where it's just a company that happened to add the word blockchain to their name and their stock price uh, skyrocketed. But there are also projects, peer-to-peer -peer networks, for doing amazing new things with this technology, like Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Zcash, that I think will last. But the question is, which one will they be? Which one will be the winner? Which one will be the Airbnb and SpaceX and not the Pets.com? So, you know, we talked about how Bitcoins went up to 20000 and then they dropped significantly. Now, uh, the Bitcoin's trading at about $15,000. Explain to me how a Bitcoin is valued. How is the value determined? So... Bitcoin is valued based on what people are willing to pay for it. There are liquid markets all over the world, um, exchanges where there are people who want to sell some because they have it or buy some because they want to make an investment or maybe because they want to use it as a technology. It's a good way to send money across borders. It's a good way to have cash for the Internet, if you will. So when there are all those buyers and sellers and there's a lot of them and some of them are big players like Peter Thiel um, or Bill Miller, you find that the market finds a price, and that's where the price comes from. Now, the other question is, the market has this demand, and that's what drives the price. What's the supply? The supply is a lot like gold. There's only so much of it in the world. It's expensive to make more of it, just like it's expensive to dig gold out of the earth. And so with that steady supply, movements in demand are what really govern the price. And if demand swings rapidly, because a lot of people learn about it because they're watching CBS, then potentially you see the price move rapidly. And that's part of the volatility as well. So, uh, Peter, Bitcoin seems to be the most familiar cryptocurrency, but it certainly isn't the only one. So how does Bitcoin compare to other digital currencies and how do, does an investor, in your own words, uh, decide or at least figure out whether the one that they're investing in is the Amazon and not the yeah. Pets.com or the VHS and not the Betamax? It's for really people who are young enough to remember what that is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. It's a good comparison, though, because it's a bit of a format war, potentially. 
Um, you know, the first thing I'd say is to anyone thinking about making these decisions, never invest more money than you'd be willing to lose. Treat this as a very risky speculative investment that you could just treat as an option. You could forget about it. And if it goes to zero, that's fine because these technologies are risky. As far as differentiating how, how all these things differ, well, Bitcoin's the original. It was uh, open source software and, uh, and a white paper that was released in 2008 and 2009 describing the technology. So it's been around for a while. It's battle tested. It's the, the, the central ledger of transactions. So the thing that powers the whole network has never been hacked, which is remarkable for, for a highly speculative new technology to, to have existed for this many years and not been hacked. So it's conservative, which sounds ridiculous when you're talking about cryptocurrencies, that it's the conservative one, but it is. From a technolo technological standpoint, it's, it's very simple. Now, the newer ones like Ethereum, um, they add more functionality. So maybe you can have more rich and interactive contracts like I will pay Anne-Marie if Vlad votes that I should pay Anne-Marie, and we all vote with our mobile phones, so it becomes <laughs> programmatic and kind of fun. We can write uh, software code for how the funds should flow according to rules. And then the other new ones like Zcash or Monero, um, they're more uh, focused on delivering greater privacy because Bitcoin actually is not very private. All the transactions that happen across the network uh, of computers around the world are public and, and auditable, which, is, which has its advantages because we can verify that, uh, say, a bank or institution has the money they say they have, uh, you know, hence the problem of the 2008 financial crisis to a certain extent. But it's also bad for privacy. You don't want to be able to see, Vlad, you don't want to be able to see Anne Marie's salary if she was being paid <laughs> in a Bitcoin transaction and the, the, the transaction was public. At least not if she knows that I've seen it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, that would exactly. make things awkward. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you know, listen, you were talking about sort of alternative cryptocurrencies, and you mentioned something about, uh, you know, some just mentioned blockchain and some companies are seeing a rise in, in their stocks. And I want to talk about that because uh, earlier today uh, in our Money Watch segment, uh, we had reported that Hooters has, is now creating or plans to create its own sort of cryptocurrency for its customers and where they can sort of gain more of this and use it to buy wings or transfer it to other customers. <laughs> but the, yeah. what the, the buy wings. No, but here's what's not so funny is the parent company of Hooters, after making that announcement, the stock, which was not doing very well, completely shot up. I, yeah. And I, I thought to myself, well, we may not understand cryptocurrencies, but clearly investors believe in the concept or else why would they invest just from yeah. an idea, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah so, so, so I, I think it was originally misreported, and it, it's actually one of the fran major franchise holders of Hooters, so it's not the parent corporation. Mm, okay. But, but that's a, a moot point, um, because the whole thing, the, the, the story is the craze over the value mm -hmm. spike in that company after they made the announcement. And I, I think that just underscores the point that we are, we are in something very similar to the dot-com bubble, where if you add dot-com to your name or your, 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 your business, which used to be just a normal like pet supply business, suddenly says, we're going to sell online in 1998, 99, you instantly see a, a, an unrealistic and over-exuberant valuation. Um, so I think that's what's happening now. Because all this is is a rewards point scheme, as it's described. Right. It's just now we'll have these tokens that will travel on a peer-to-peer -peer ledger or a blockchain, which is the technology underlying Bitcoin, that will be your gift card or will be your loyalty point. I, I mean, I think that's an exciting potential use of this technology, but it's not really exciting you know it's it's not world changing it's right. just easier loyalty points and that's definitely probably not worth a 50 percent boost in the price of a stock right. so there's a lot of irrational exuberance going on i'd say and so peter finally i just want to ask you i mean for for my parents who keep asking me where can i get one of these bitcoins <laughs> there actually isn't a coin right although we see graphics, graphics all the time confuse they're, they're people. always confuse I hate people those. they always I hate they those confuse a lot of older people i think <laughs> and some older, younger yeah. and some young people too who are just like hey can i have a a change purse with a lot of bitcoins <laughs> in them how to explain for people there is no Bitcoin. Yeah, so there aren't little physical coins. Those are just, some people made them and they added the little digital code or the data that actually constitutes a Bitcoin to the coin. Mm. And then you have a physical embodiment of it. But really it's just data. It's, it's a secret key that you keep on your phone or you use a company like Coinbase or Zappo to, to keep that secret for you. It's that, it's that unique code that gives you access to some Bitcoins that are described on the Bitcoin blockchain or on the ledger. 
And only with that secret key can you then send the Bitcoins to someone else. So unless someone else can find out your secret key, they can't spend your Bitcoins by sending them to someone else. Now, that's a little crazy, and this all sounds very abstract. And do I really want to have uh, uh, you know, potentially a thousands of dollars worth of Bitcoins on my phone? I'm not sure I'm comfortable with my cybersecurity. People get hacked all the time. The easy way to get Bitcoin or to get Ether or a lot of other cryptocurrencies is to use one of the regulated exchanges that are out there. And, and those exchanges are companies like Coinbase, as I said, Zappo. And I, our organization, Coin Center, is based in DC and we focus on regulation and the law as it relates to the technology. And one thing I want to dispel is this rumor that Bitcoin's not regulated. Um, the companies that help people buy it, or the companies that make markets between buyers and sellers, they are regulated. They collect information about their customers, they do suspicious activity reporting and anti-money laundering policies, and they've been doing it since 2013. So they're pretty reputable institutions, actually. And if, if you really do want to make an investment, and I caution everyone to think carefully about that, because I do think we're in a bubble, those are the companies you want to go to. And, and it'll be a relatively easy experience like online banking. Very interesting stuff. Peter Van Valkenburg, thank you as always. It's really great to talk to you about this. Yeah. Thanks, Anne-Marie. Thanks, Vlad. Thanks.